Okay, uh, everyone, I think we're about, about ready to uh, begin our last program in this series, uh, this special exhibit on uh, preserving the past, camp towns and coal company houses. And it's been a real delight today because uh, we had a couple of things we can celebrate that coincide together uh, that we can kind of celebrate in the fact that we are actually imp impressing ourselves upon the past. And that is, uh, first of all, we're going to have Larry Fields talk to us about any number of topics. Uh, we hope to hear a little bit about his uh, preservation of the historic buildings, and we'll get to him in a minute. And I just wanted to kind of mention the other kind of really wonderful thing was the, I don't know if any of you saw the paper yesterday in the Morning Sun, and uh, Mission Clay Products has uh, donated the, uh, the Inslee Model K-12 um, dragline and bucket to the museum. Got a donation there, that'll be wonderful. And this K-12 drag line was originally used to mine coal in Southeast Kansas, but it was later purchased by Dickey Clay uh, Company, and that was to mine clay so they could build, uh, kind of manufacture their clay tile pipes, which brought to mind uh, a year of 1890 when Arthur E. Stilwell and his uh, fellow uh, investors were wanting to build this you know, wonderful hotel, this luxurious hotel. And there weren't any brick, brick plants in the area, and uh, it was way too costly for them to have to transport the bricks into town. So they knew they'd probably have to establish a plant, a site where they could do this, which they did. And to their delight, they found that this clay that we have here is very rich and very um, stable, and it produced wonderfully solid bricks. And uh, not only did the hotel get built, but the city of Pittsburgh all got paved. Uh, we, in fact, some of us, uh, Karen Brady, some of us saved, saved the bricks after that, but uh, so some of us are still living on these wonderful bricks. And not only that, other brick uh, companies came in here then to establish themselves, and that was Dickey Clay. They came in, They're, they've been here well over 100 years. And uh, uh, consequently, we have uh, uh, their machine that they are, are donating to us through their parent company, Mission Clay. Uh, saving and restoring the Stillwell was an important, very important thing, and it, it played an important role in our history. There are a lot of stories there that we could say for a different time, but I want to move on to say that through these uh, months that we've had Jerry Lomshack and Virgil Albertini, you know, they presented on preserving the camp houses and camp towns and how valuable that is. And our last presenter, if you remember, Diana Starinsic dean um, gave us some tips on how to research a property and uh, you know, telling us that the history uh, is more than just the history of a space. You know, a building is more than, than just of what's in it or what it looks like. It's also a connection to the people who came before us and the times in which they live. So we're making these connections and that's what brings us to our speaker today which in his own personal way, Larry Fields has uh, dedicated, uh, I think his passion, I, I think it's a passion, isn't it, Larry? More than a- Mental defect. It's a mental <laughs> defect. Uh, to a couple of things. I just have to read a little bit about his history because he's gonna tell you a little bit about both. Uh, one of the most fascinating things I think about Larry to me is that he is one of 15 children. I mean, 10 boys and five- And, and none of us ever convicted. <laughs> There you go. Uh, his, uh, his father uh, was a Kansas City Southern laborer, yeah. and his uh, both grandfathers worked in the coal mines. So we have a connection that way, too. Larry graduated from Pittsburgh High School, and yeah. as a young 17-year-old, he went immediately to work for the Kansas City Southern, and then he went to the Army. And after his stint with the U.S. Army, he returned to the Kansas City Southern, he started as a brakeman, a conductor, an engineer, worked his way up, and entered in 1970 into management. And his bio is really, I mean, I'm just gonna give you a few things on how connected he is with uh, the railroad industry. He was a trained master, an assistant superintendent, a superintendent, a general master, an assistant vice president for personnel and labor relations, vice president of transportation, vice president of operations, Kansas City Southern and Louisiana and Arkansas railways. He was executive vice president of, of, that, of those very railways. He was president and CEO of Texas and Mexican Railway. And after serving on the board 
Uh, he served on s several boards of directors, uh, uh, mainly the Kansas City Southern. Kansas City Southern, the no, Kansas City Southern Railway Board of Directors, yes. And other uh, national and others, ones. Yeah, some national, I won't even tell you how nah. many because there's quite a few. Um, they have low standards, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to work a little comedy routine up here. I'm going to be a straight man. Um, Larry is real appreciative of his railroad career because he said, this kid from southeast Kansas had an opportunity through working with the uh, railroads to visit seven different countries. That's true. Yeah. And uh, he'll tell you about those. They're quite amazing. And um, through that, through those visits, he got a chance to really explore and discover old buildings. You know, I think all of us, when we go, if all of us have gone to Europe, we really appreciate the uh, architecture and the age of things. Well, Larry has a lot of experience with that. Um, I think really one of the main focuses that I think he brings to his talks is that his mission is not only to preserve historic buildings, but it's also to make certain that they serve the community. So I really think that's a valuable asset to all of us, is, is to make them part of our community. So with that, would you give a warm welcome to our, uh, He's not a convict. He's not. Uh, he's, he's not even working right now. Are you? Are you working I'm re anymore? He's I'm. I'm the head janitor at the Frisco. Yeah, he's the head janitor. <laughs> welcome, please welcome Larry Field. I'll turn this button on and hold it, right? That's right. Okay. Well, yeah. Is it working? Oh, it works. Okay. Right. All right. Thank, Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. Um, I'm. I'm glad I grew up in southeast Kansas. I'm glad I'm one of 15 children. I have a sister and a brother-in-law sitting here. They, they must not have known I was the speaker. They, they would have, <laughs> might have stayed away. But, uh, but being in that larger family, you learn to get along and to fight and to squabble and to share and, uh, and to do without sometimes is necessary. So it's a, it's a great place to grow up. There's good things. There, um, and I had a great career. I was very, very fortunate. Uh, W.N. Doremus, who was chairman of the board and a multi-billionaire, you know, that's real money. Uh, and he and I were quite good friends. He called me, he, well, I won't tell you what he called me, it's Sunday, but, uh, and I called him the hat forever. But he was born and reared in Pittsburgh, Kansas. He lived here until he was nine years old. And there's very few people know that. You've got a Doremus Park in Pittsburgh, and there's Doremus Parks in 11 different states that I'm aware of. And what I, one of the reasons I love the man and his wife both, Pat, they, every December they gave away $20 million anonymously. Every December for at least 25 years that I was involved and knew about it. And, and that number went up, that value went up every year. They didn't want their name on anything. They didn't want to be recognized for anything. Don't, you know, don't bother us with that. Because like he had told me, if somebody knows you give money away, they're going to knock on your door. They're going to come see you. So they, they had lots of money, but they gave it a lot away and shared it. Um, so I, like, as I said, and, and he loved the railroad. The Kansas City Southern Industries is now, is now gone. And I'm going to talk about railroads because railroads and mining, they, they're symbiotic. They, they, they're hand in glove. You would have never moved the coal without the railroads. And we all know about the railroads, I mean, that was here. Pe very few people realize there were seven railroads in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Seven. Today in the United States, I'm going to, before I get to the other stuff, I want to show you something here. This is the list of the class one railroads in the United States. Right here. That's it. That's how many, this is not, now this is a 1956 model. In the 1966, they only print them every 10 years. So I've got a 66. I don't know where it's at. Suki, my wife moved it. But, uh, <laughs> but there's 800 and some in 1956 and 1966. Class one, and the class is just a financial number. If you were doing $500 million, that may not write the amount of money, but if, you're doing, if you have one mile of railroad and did 500 million, you're a class one. If you had 5,000 miles and didn't do 100 million, you're, you're a regional. So, but 800 in 1966. Today, in the United States, that's it. That's it, that's how many class one railroads we have in the United States. You're either gonna be big or you're gonna be gone. So today in the United States, we only have five, five class ones. That's it. The Burlington Northern Santa Fe by themselves is about eight, over 800 railroads combined and commingled together. Now the efficiencies are there, but what happens to our country 
is the same thing. Not just this industry, automobile plants. How many stores has Walmart? And, I, and Walmart, I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad they're, they're, they employ a lot of people. I'm not saying anything bad about any of that at all. We need them. But how many stores have disappeared? Just in, in every little old town. Tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands. So this one industry has suffered from 800 and some to five. That's a pretty large reduction. Uh, great thing about this book, you can find any little old town in America just about if you're looking for them, if you want to find them. But, uh, I've been asked, uh, they had a, an event at the Frisco the other night, and uh, uh, night of the Friendly Tavern that was on Broadway for many, many years, and there's quite a few people showed up. And it was a nice event. And uh, at the end of it, I didn't know, but I was asked at the very end of it uh, to say something about the Frisco, and I mentioned how it was purchased. And uh, so I've been asked twice today, and I had a phone call uh, this week, would you tell how the Frisco was purchased when you, when you bought it? Well, I worked in the railroad industry, as has been said, a long time. I retired and came back to Pittsburgh. My wife had a hard time with Pittsburgh. We don't have enough shoe stores in this area for most folks, so it was a difficult you know, adjustment for her. But uh, she's now satisfied, and, and uh, we're doing all right with that. But before I retired, I'd come by, and the, and the Frisco, and it's actually the Kansas City, Fort Scott, and Memphis. That was the railroad, which was owned by the Frisco. So the railroad was actually Kansas City, Fort Scott, and Memphis. Before 1906, every railroad had to have headquarters in every state you operated in. All the states wanted you to have headquarters, wanted you to have jobs, wanted you to pay taxes. So the Frisco, St. Louis, San Francisco is headquartered in St. Louis. Kansas City, Fort Scott, and Memphis, 100% owned by the Frisco, headquartered in Wyandotte County, Kansas. Uh, Arkansas Western, their Arkansas side was in Fort Smith, Arkansas. So all the railroads did the same thing. The Kansas City Southern, the little piece here that runs through Kansas, was the Kansas City, Pittsburgh, and Gulf. And they had headquarters in, actually in uh, Pittsburgh. And then they ended up moving it to Kansas City, Kansas. But, uh, so, but all of that changed in about 1908 or 1910, so then they could uh, put them all together. But I showed my wife, I said, so we'd, we'd come to visit my mother and stuff. I don't know where, I think we're living in Houston or Baton Rouge or somewhere. And we were up here, and, I, we've, and I'd been by, and I've honestly been in, a thousand depots and that many roundhouses and car shops and those kind of things in at least nine different countries. And they're all, they built them for time and all eternity. Even a wooden trestle out here on the railroad, it is built to last 100 years based on tonnages and impacts and all that, minus fires and floods. You know, you don't, you don't control that. Mother Nature is still in charge. But they build them to last 100 years. So these depots are built to last 100 years. And we drove down and they have cable around the building and, and there's some pictures going around what it looked like and I'll pass that out in a minute. And it was boarded up and keep out signs, you know, all stay away, keep out, private property, all of those things. And you could come in from the back side and you could miss those signs so you wouldn't see them if you found the right way in. And, she could, and trash piled up everywhere and windows broke out. And I told my wife, I said, I'm going to buy that building when, when I retire. If it's here, I'm going to buy it because it's going to get tore down and, and what's going to happen to it. And she thought I was crazy. And <laughs> later she decided I really was crazy when it, when it happened. But so retired, and so I tried to find out who owned it. I said, I think Mackie Clemens owns it. You know, they've been around since 1888, 1890 here. And they, they, one time, they were one of the largest privately owned coal companies in the United States, over 600 employees in this area at, all, at one time. So they had more than that uh, over the years. And they are still in business today. They're headquartered up at Ottawa, Kansas. Uh, they're still in business. They're in, they have rock quarries and oil fields and oil pumps and wells and different things, and they're still in business. A, a pipe mill that they own, so they're, they're a very successful family, and they do, do, do very well. So I said, well, who owns it? You know, they, they said, well, you can't buy it. They're under bankruptcy. Well, bankruptcy doesn't last forever. You know, they're, they're, finally, you, you work through those things. And I went to school with them, Mary Mackey, not M-A-R-Y, but M-E-R-R. I.E., I guess it is, you know, always happy. And she was a very, very attractive young woman in school and smart. And uh, so I never had anything to do with somebody like that. You know, it wouldn't have nothing to do with me, but I knew who she was. And so I called somebody. I said, can I get a hold of Mary Mackey? Somebody got her phone number, and so I call her. And she's living in, I, I think, Porta Guta, Florida, something like that. And I call, and the answering machine comes on. Hi, this is Mary. Thanks for calling. I'm probably out on the beach picking up shells. And I'm thinking, well, here in this area, we're walk the strip pit dumps and pick up flat shells and skip them. So we're similar, you know. But, so I left a message. I didn't expect to call back. And within 10 minutes, she called back. 
and uh, my wife and I were sitting at the kitchen table, and I said, you know, I said, this is Larry Fitz. She said, you know, act like we've been great friends, you know, and she was friendly. She was really a nice person. She said, I said, well, who owns it? She said, well, you need to talk to, and I want to be careful how the names I use because it's, I said, you need to talk to Dennis. He now runs the company, and he's in charge of it, and I'll give you his phone number. So she gives me the phone number, and never answer the phone without a pencil in your hand and paper to write on. You all come up. We all, we're all old enough to know that, so I had that write down, verified it, and never call a business on Friday afternoons or Monday mornings. You're wasting your time. He or she's already left that can make the decision makers are already gone. So and in Monday mornings, you're not going to get them because they're doing the work they should have done Friday. And uh, so you don't get them on Monday morning. So I waited till Tuesday. My wife and I are sitting at the kitchen table and I call. And a very nice lady named Kay up in uh, Ottawa, Kansas, answers the phone. Mackie Clemens Fuel and two or three other names. And I said, hi, my name is Larry Fields. I live in Pittsburgh. And I'd like to talk to Dennis. I'm I, uh, interested in it. What is it about? And I said, I'm interested in maybe acquiring the old Frisco Depot in Pittsburgh. And she said, uh, have you talked to anyone? I said, well, I'm, I've been given this phone number and told to talk to Dennis. Well, okay, let me see if he's in. That, you know, that, that's, so puts me on hold for a minute or two and comes back and says, okay, I'm going to put you in the office. And so he uh, puts me in there. And he said, hello. Uh, hi, my name is Larry Fields. I, I know. He said, she told me. I said, well, I said, I'm interested in possibly acquiring the old Frisco Depot. I noticed it's in pretty bad shape. It's been empty 41 years, set and vacant, 41, other than cats, pigeons, and whatever. And he said, uh, what would you say your name was? And I said, well, it's Larry Fields, and okay, cautiously. You know, I wanted to use an alias, but I didn't. I said, you know, he said, well, Mr. Fields, is there a for sale sign there on that property? I said, well, not that I've seen, no, sir. I didn't see one. He said, well, what the hell did you call me for? And he, and he hung up. <clears throat> and my wife said, ah, you know, big a jackass as you are. You know. uh, no, he's not. He's not that big. So I start to call him, but I don't. I said, no, I could, you know, count to 10 and spit or whatever you're supposed to do. And so, so I thought, okay, I think my wife was secretly glad that it wasn't going to happen because she didn't think much of that building anyway. So I roamed around town and I went in the back way again. And I walked the property and I took down some of the signs that was barely hanging on like they fell off and some of the keep out signs and no trespassing, all that stuff. And I walked around and I climbed up on what was left of the deck and looked and tried to peek up in a window. And it was trashy and junky. And there's a tree, there's a photo somewhere, and there's a tree growing up right in the center of that thing. But at least it's a cottonwood. It's not one of them doggone skinny pines from East Texas. It's a real tree, <laughs> cottonwood. So the Tuesday I call, 10 o'clock in the morning, call back up there. And this lady, and I got to know her a little bit, and her name's Kay. I said, Kay, it's Larry Fields. I'd like, she said, are you sure you want to talk to him? I said, yeah. I said, I'm, I, I, I've done some looking, a little investigating. She said, okay, I'm going to let me see if he's in, you know. So... A couple minutes later, he puts me in there, and he got the speaker phone on. He said, uh, what do you want? I said, hi, it's Larry Fields. He said, I know. You know. <laughs> and my wife's enjoying this. And, uh, I said, I'm an honest buyer. I'm not a hobbyist. I had a good career, and I would be interested in buying the depot. It's, uh, it doesn't appear that you're using it right now. And, and he said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Didn't I talk to you last week? I said, well, yes, sir, we, we talked last week. He said, it's still not for sale, and he hung up again. <laughs> so I struck out two times, but you get three. So I thought, well, and I waited a week again, and I called Tuesday, the next Tuesday morning. About 9.55, I called, and this very nice lady again answered the phone, and I said, I want to try one more time. She said, you're talking to the wrong person. And I said, oh. Oh, I said, well, who should I be talking to? She said, do you know Maxine? I don't know Maxine. I said, no, I don't have any idea. She said, it used to be Maxine Mackey, Mackey Clemens. I said, oh, okay. I, my light goes on finally, you know. And she said, I'm going to give you a phone number, and if you ever tell anybody I gave you this phone number, <laughs> you know, ever, I don't want it. So, and she said, you wait 10 minutes and call. And I waited to exactly 10 minutes and I called and the phone didn't even get through ringing once very sweet voice answered the phone and she said is this Mr. Fields I said this is Larry Fields yes and uh, 
She said, okay. She said, uh, I was expecting your call, obviously, because it was just that quick. She said, all right. She said, um, who have you been talking to? I said, well, I was given the name of a guy named Dennis, some jackass, and all he does is holler at me and hang up on the phone. And she said, that would be my husband. <laughs> and that's true. And I thought, well, well, you know, that's not a very good way to start with, with Maxine. But uh, she said, let's set that aside for now. And I thought, that's a good idea. Set that, you know, sometimes you, but I was frustrated. What did matter? I shouldn't have said that again. But she said, I've got some questions for you. She said, what is your plan for that building? I said, what do, you, what do you mean my plan for the building? She said, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to do like that damn college and that damn city and tear it down? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, remember, this is pre-Block 22. Now, this is exactly right. I, I don't know. This is, what, this is how Maxine proceeded. I said, I have no idea what that is, but I, my plan is, is to get it back as close to original as possible. She said, it's going to cost a lot of money. I said, we'll handle that, I think. She said, so t I'm going to ask you again, what are you going to do with the building? I said, I don't have a business plan, if that's what you're seeking, but my, I will get that building back. I said, I've got 40 plus years, 45 years of railroad experience. Part of it in B&B, B &B, by the way, is not bed and breakfast. It's bridge and building. Has been since the 1840s in the railroad industry. So b and B's bridge and building, okay? So... B and B, give me yeah, the bones were good. I knew it was built well. It was built. It's three bricks thick. The walls are 16 inches thick. The roof is gone. The windows are gone. The, you know, it's in bad shape. But I said I'll do my best, and I will get it back. I've got photographs the way it looked in 1890, and I'll get the decks around it. The tracks are gone and things. And I said I will do my best to get it back to service. I don't know what I'll do with it. We have enough bars, and restaurants, and probably maybe not enough churches, but we've got plenty. Uh, Lots of varieties, and so it doesn't need to be any of those things. It needs to be something, though, that can be used by the public and be, be a benefit to the city as well. The city was good to us. People were good to us growing up. Uh, we didn't have a lot, but people were good to us, and I wanted to help return something. And I do love the old buildings. I think uh, they're built well, and I told her I'm going to do my best to get it back. She said, okay, you call the office Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. And I said, okay, I will do that. And I called about 9.55 a.m. Tuesday and the following Tuesday. And she said, okay, um, Maxine just arrived and she's in the office. And I'm going to put you in there. With, she's in the office with Dennis. And so after a minute or so, the phone, it's on the speakerphone. The phone picks up. Hello. I said, good morning. It's Larry Fields on this. Said, yeah, we know. We know. He said, yeah. I said, uh, I'm supposed to call. Yeah, I know all about it. You know, I said, uh, well, I said, I'm interested in buying. He said, Okay. He said, all right, I understand. We've talked about it here. He said, well, I, I know. He said, I don't know how you got his number, but he said, we understand. He said, I know. It. He said, griping and mad. But he said, uh, you got any money? I said, I got a little bit of money. I said, I know people that are silly enough to loan me money. And uh, uh, so Maxine said, I said, Dennis, sell it to this man. I want it sold to this man. That's her money. And she had an emotional tie to that building. She caught passenger trains there with her dad and her grandfather. And she grew up in there and around there in that area in Plain. And she wanted the building saved. She did not want it tore down. There was a plan to tear that building, the Frisco, down for parking. And I think it currently has 54 parking spaces off street. I have more parking downtown than probably anybody, private parking. And, of course, they had their headquarters on the other end. The Mackey Clemens was built in 1961. And it is really a nice building. Terrazzo floors and 16-inch walls and really, really a nice building. Built, money wasn't an object when they built that building in 1960. They moved in in 61. And so he said, uh, here's the price. And he told me, and I think twice as much as what I did, a little back of the envelope figure, and I knew what, and pretty good estimate what it was going to take to do a lot of work to it. And I said, well, that's, that's way more than it's worth. And I shouldn't have said that. He said, do you want me to hang up? <laughs> said, no, 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 don't hang up. I said, uh, I'll do it. And my wife, chin hit the table. And, and uh, she, he said, uh, I want to close in uh, 15 days. 
I said, okay. I had just sold some property to Walmart in Pittsburgh at Centennial and Routh. I had a, two acres there in, in the building and they, they overpaid. <laughs> uh, uh, they want something, get out of their way. You know, they're going to do a deal. And uh, um, so I was setting on some money I needed to invest anyway or pay quite a bit of taxes on it. And nobody wants to pay any more taxes than they have to. And so I said, that's fine. I'll, I can do that in 15 days. He said, I'm going to send you a, he said, you know, uh, Mark Warner, attorney in Pittsburgh. I said, yes. He said, I'm going to, he's going to write you a contract. You go see it and sign it. I said, okay. Well, two days, Mark Warner called and said, hey, I got something for you to come and look at. And it was about seven, eight, nine pages. And it was the right amount of money that he had said, which it still was too much money. And I didn't like it, but I didn't, uh, but I wanted to do it. Had my mind made up, I was going to do it. I knew I wasn't ever going to get my money back, more than likely. Um, so I said, I, you know, you got to sign it. But I did notice one little thing that I thought, man, this is so childish. It's like 1.4 acres altogether down there. It's 400 feet long, 125 feet deep, something like that. 1.4 acres. And they had an entire paragraph in there, like seven, eight lines, all the mineral rights, coal, gas, golds, on that 1.4 acres they retain. I thought, what in the, what? you paid that attorney more money to write that paragraph than, and you'd never dig it up anyway. And that's just the policy of this company. Okay, fine, you know, I understand, okay. So they do that. So I sign it and it goes off. And, all right, we had a close in Ottawa and he gave me the date. And be here at such and such a date and a certain time. And I went up early. I went, didn't, I went up probably an hour early. And I drove around. I went to McDonald's and got an Egg McMuffin and a, some of the really bitter coffee they have. And I showed up about 15 minutes early. And I go in the office. And I'd never met him. And his office door's open. I did meet Kay. And she was very nice. And I said, I'm fine. Don't you? And he's sitting there with Kansas. I know it's Kansas City Star because it's a big, big newspaper. He sees me. I need just take it. He's talking. <laughs> you know, let me suffer a little bit. So I... Uh, Get in there and, and have you got your check? Yeah, and here's his check, Commerce Bank. And um, so he's got his money. And here's all the description of the land. And I, I was still a little disturbed. I was paying so much money for the property. And as I'm sitting here reading this, I'm not buying the Frisco. I'm buying the Frisco and the headquarters. And the headquarters is really, they spent huge amount of money. All terrazzo floors, four bathrooms, full kitchen, really I'd say about 4,800 square feet, 16 parking, all private parking spaces, nice architecture. It's got a walk-in bank vault, 12 by 16, that works, you know, and all, so it's, you know, it's like anything else. It need, it's dated, it needed some stuff. It had a lot of carpet that needed to come out, but they're terrazzo floors. The only one that does terrazzo floors is your state and federal government. You know, some universities, it's too expensive, you know, but it's beautiful stuff, lasts forever. And it's built on a 12-inch pad, not a 4-inch, not a 12-inch concrete pad. So, you know, I'm, now I'm feeling really good. I'm pretty cocky, you know? Hey, you know. hey, this is a hell of a buy. Wait till I get home and show Suki what a good deal this was, you know? But uh, so he got his money, but he writes in the, in the market, wait a minute, 60 days before you can come on the property. I don't want you on the property, you can't come in the building. But I'm, Scribble that out. I want 90 days, and he initial, initialed that. So, for 90 days, I couldn't. I wasn't supposed to be on the property, and, uh, but, and honest to goodness, that's how the thing was bought. And they got stuff out of there, and it, and it didn't. And, and Suki can tell you this: when we we hadn't closed, when it gets makes the newspaper thing, you know, that's public information. You know, we had a half a dozen calls. How in the world did you buy that? You know, we've been trying to buy that for blah blah blah, however long. Can't get it done. You didn't know who to talk to. Right, is the reason. He grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. She grew up right, right here. So it's her money. But we've had, within a week, we had two calls willing to buy the, the Mackie Clemens headquarter building for more money than we paid for the whole thing. And Suki, of course, said, let's sell that baby. Said, no, 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 no. We're not selling, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not going to buy anything else right now. But we're not, but, so it turned out to be a really, really good deal. And that's just the case. Sometimes, don't give up. It's difficult to buy some of these things. And, I'd, and I looked at a dozen buildings around town, but I, was, I really wanted a railroad building simply because I've been in so many and I know how well they are built. So that was a big piece of it. And I've read a book, and this is really, really a boring book, by the way. But anybody, the, the death and life, 
you know, back, back on the buildings for a minute, the death and life of American cities. And this is uh, Jane Jacobs, and she's an <coughs> activist. The book was written in 1961. And in 1961, she had spent quite a bit of time saying, building all of these malls, giant malls all over the place, building interstate highways right through cities and tearing down homes and houses and disrupting families, and you're doing it all over the country for interstate highways, and you blow right through them. And in 20 years, 30 years, they're going to move out of the malls, and they're not going to use the malls, and they want a small ones. And how many stores, we talked a little bit earlier, how many has Walmart closed, little mom and pops and what have you. And the railroads was 800, and now there's five. But she was forecasting all of that, and she was an activist, and it's how, what you do, how you get, try to do it and say some of these. And I've said, and I've said for years, I'm not, I'm not an activist, I'm not a tree hugger, I do like the trees. We all have to do our best to recycle and do the most we can do for our, for our kids and grandkids and those coming later, because the world is changing, however you want to blame it on. Mother Nature is still in charge. But it's hard to buy these buildings. A lot of times they're, they, they get in such bad, if the roof's gone, you'll lose them. You've got, to get, you've got to get started and save them and get them dry. And they're hard to buy. Mackey wasn't using the building. But Mackey had moved on. It did not meet their business plans. They, and their headquarters had changed. Where their operations were at had changed. So they didn't want it. They didn't need it. And what they were getting out of it, they thought they were going to do a transaction with, with Pitt State and the city for tax credits and some money. And so he ended up getting basically what he wanted. But the building was saved by, thanks to Maxine, who, by the way, she brought when it was done. And it took about a year and a half to complete that thing. And it's, well, you never get complete. There's always maintenance and always things to do. But she brought uh, her daughter and three grandsons and a granddaughter. And the, and the grandkids spent the night in the depot. Code violation, by the way. Don't tell the city. Uh, Maxine did not. Uh, uh, but, uh, so they spent a night there. And the kids, grandkids have been back one other time and spent the night in there. So she's just thrilled to death that the building's there. And, and so am I. And the building is used. And we do donate it quite a lot uh, for different functions and different things. Uh, we have had funerals and weddings and uh, celebrations of life and parties and drunks and, you know, a little bit of everything in there. Uh, but it's a good building. It's a great location. There is a lot going on there. The university will be announcing the gorilla rising one of these days for long. Uh, and they're being careful this time when they make their announcement that they've got contracts, not memorandums of understanding, contracts. So be more careful what you say. And, uh, but there's going to be a lot of money spent there. So the property is valuable, and it is, it is a good piece of property. It costs a lot of money to save it. It's, uh, it's worth more than I have in it. Uh, and it's, a, it's used by the city of Pittsburgh. And we've, we've had, uh, I don't know, my wife would know exactly, but there's been like 15 or 18 weddings and that many funerals or celebrations of life, at least that many. And a lot of receptions. Uh, city code allows 220 uh, is what it's, and there's a, the west end of it was the passenger station, the entire east end, 100 and, it's 128 foot long, 36 feet wide inside. And that was the freight house. Um, so it's a good building, solid building, took a lot to get it done, uh, but I'm glad it's here, and, I, and it is on the National Register. You can put a lot of things on the state, so it's on the state register, but it is on the National Register. And uh, that is the uh, parks and the National Parks that handles that, and it's not easy to get on the National. The year that we applied and got it all done, and I, I brought a copy of it, it's about 59 pages, so there's a lot of work, a lot of paperwork, and there are monies to help you with it. But once you start a project, if you start, and you can't wait, the problem with it is you can, you can file for a grant and you can get some grant money. I didn't get any, zero, but I didn't apply for any because it takes too darn long. And if you've got a hole in your roof with tree growing through it and it's halfway across the building, you can't wait. You've got to get started. So once you start, then you're done. You can't apply and say, oh, hey, I want to get this roof done. No, that didn't work that way. You've got to apply, and once you apply, You've got to pay all your bills. You've got to make sure there can't be any liens on anything. You've got to get it all done, pay all your taxes, no, no liens of any kind on the property. Everything paid for, and it's got to be clear, and you've got to show ownership. Then they'll reimburse you whatever portion of it was approved. And any time you uh, have a transaction in Crawford County, I always wonder, I say, where does this money come from? It's, it's not just free money. It doesn't grow on trees. It comes from somewhere. Well, part of it comes from, every one of these that ever bought a piece of property in Crawford County, 
pays a small portion. There's a fee. Fees, lots of fees, you know. Go to the bank, see how many fees they got, you know. Got a fee for coming in the door, I think. But, but there's a small fee. It's like a buck eighty-five, or maybe it's more now. Every transaction, and that money goes to the Kansas Historic Fund grants. And so that's a part of it. But no county can get, I think it's over thirty or $40,000 a year out of it. Um, but you can spread it out over years to get the money. If you, but it's a huge amount of paperwork to get it done. So when this thing goes to the national, it's in Washington, D.C. And uh, so we have kids close by, so it was a good reason to go. Go sponge off them for a few days. And, uh, but there was 37 facilities in Kansas that applied. And I was told by the a guy named Rick Anderson, who's in Topeka, and he's a full-time historic uh, grant writer in Kansas uh, for the state. He said, Larry, nobody ever gets on the first read. You know, this is not going to happen. So well, I'm going anyway. You know, I'm, I'll go and I'll help present. And if, if the owner cares enough to come, he said, it always makes a difference. So we go. My wife didn't go to it, but uh, she stayed with the kids, and I was, went. And there was 37, I think that's right. And, one, and of the 37, two got on. The fire station in Kansas, downtown Kansas City, Kansas, was built in 1918 or 19 or 20 along in there, and it's a beautiful building, and that's owned by the city, and it got on the national, and the other one, and they get out the thing, it is the uh, Frisco Depot in Pittsburgh, Kansas, so that was pretty, uh, you know, made me feel pretty good, but uh, it's a lot of work, but, but the good thing about following the railroad history of it, they've got good records. Their records are better than John Doe's and Jane Doe's and something that was a, a blacksmith shop. You know, just because it's old, it doesn't mean it's worth saving either. Sometimes public benefit and cost outweighs uh, doing them. Uh, so this building was a good one. It's in, uh, it's in pretty good shape today. It is, uh, my wife uh, loves the building now. She does. She says, uh, I'm the head janitor. Not just dead. I'm the head janitor. And uh, so... We got that one, and when we got that one done, I said, we need to do one more, and she disagreed. So, and I shopped around, so I'm going to make this. The old Pitcraft building is, a, is not the Pitcraft building. Uh, they bought it in about 19, they moved in in 56, rent, and I think they bought it in 66, and they ended up closing and moving out of there. And they did a great job. Now, they, I'm not faulting anything they did. They, you can do more with your copy machine on your desk at home than a printing shop can do today, I mean, comparatively. And that business is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And you got this great big building that they don't need and all this great big equipment that nobody wants and has zero, may have cost $100,000 and today, it, when they were looking at it, it's worth a couple thousand if you could get rid of it. And it's just not worth anything. And they had to shrink and they had to do things. And they'd put in a couple ceilings and some things and lowered the ceilings and, and, needed, and they'd quit spending money on it. And I'm not faulting them at all. There was no money in there to be made. And so they quit using it about 99 or 2,000 other than for storage. The water was off and the electricity was off and the, the windows were broke. Some of them. And they bricked in every single window on the ground floor. Every window was bricked in. And so I decided that's the building I wanted to buy because it had good... One thing I want is parking. Walmart builds parking for some reason and Target likes parking. And these places, you know, if you don't have parking... Well, some of the college kids might park their scooter in front, you know, that little thing, but most people aren't going to walk a block or two blocks to get to you. So it had parking, and I liked the looks of it. You know, when I, when I climbed up through those two ceilings and got up there, and all of this, three, three rows of, of cast iron, went in 1880, uh, Carnegie Steel, Peoria, Illinois, and every hash mark on a beam is a month. So you, if you look at these beams, these old buildings, you look at a hash mark, that's month. So if there's five, it's, it's May. So it's th this Carnegie Steel, Peoria, uh, done in Peoria, 1872. So it's old steel, all hand-hammered rivets, and it's 48 feet, 10 inches to the top inside. Tore out two ceilings. I think we had, I was Randy Vallely's best friend for about three months. We loaded 17 dumpsters, the big 20-footers. 20, 20 and, uh, and Randy's a good guy. And Randy cleaned up, and people love him or hate him. I happen to love the guy. He's great. If you ask him to do something, he'll do it. Tell him, not going to happen. But, so we got that thing cleaned up, used hikas. I tore out all the I'm really good tearing apart. I got it tore out, opened up all the windows. Pigeons having a good time. They all moved in. It's a condo, and I got hundreds of them living in there. And You needed umbrellas, honestly, some days. Uh, it was that bad. 
but it was all square. The building, you put a laser on it, it was off about an eighth of an inch in 186 feet. So the full length 186 feet, and it's 82 feet wide at one end and 67 or 8 at the other, about 15,500 square feet with 50-foot ceiling, 48 feet 10 inches, with three sets of windows going up, and it's a and I had an old pictures that somebody had gave me to come by. And by the way, everybody in Pittsburgh's grandpa did not work there. <laughs> and there's at least 100 of them that come by, my Uncle Bob or my Uncle, my all work there. You know, so, but not all of them. But, but this guy brought me a picture, and it's got this nice stonework, you know, all around the windows. And so I asked uh, Hykus, who does a lot of stonework here. They're really good. He's got a guy who works with him named Crazy Joe, who's earned that reputation, but he, they are great masons and magicians. He said, I know where that stone came from. It came from Redfield, Kansas. He said, that's the same exact stone. He said, I know that. They're still in business. I said, no, no way. It can't be. Yep. Same family runs it. I said, so we go up there and it's in a creek bed and it is the same company that sold to Pittsburgh Iron and, and we bought the same stone that was around there. We got around all the windows on the ground floor and we put a cap along the top and the foundation was gone. They had poured concrete and this lime and the sandstone was held water. So we replaced all of that and put this nice stone along there. And so it's a really made an attractive building. So it's hard to believe that from that company is still, and it's like saying Jeb Clamet, got uh, Clampton or whatever his name, the overalls and no shirt and the big beard and the flop hat and, and old equipment and they slice in the creek, and I would go up with the trailer, and I'd get an eight feet wide, 16 feet long slab, that's all I could haul, and I'd haul it back down, and Hykus and his guys would take the rock saws, and they'd get out there, and Crazy Joe, the reason they call him crazy, it's, you couldn't see, one guy's supposed to be watering down, keep the dust down, and while you're cutting this, and Joe's got his mask on, he's got a cigarette stuck out of that little, you know. so I said, OSHA would love to see this, I want a picture of this, buddy, you know. but uh, he's, and his wife's a nurse, and I mean, you can't even see the dust. And he's, it's, it's not bad enough that you can't see the dust, but here's that cigarette stuck in there. So, uh, you earned the name, Joel, but he's a great, great stonemason. So they did all of those work. And so that building is um, built in 1879. It's, we believe it's the oldest commercial building in Pittsburgh. We're not positive. We think it is. There is a, uh, behind where Bite Singers used to be, there's a, a blacksmith shop in there that we think's older, but we're not positive yet. It's hard to... We, Hard to find the ownership on some of this stuff. But that building is a, is a really good building. And so you're looking around, what are you going to use a building that size for? We've got lots of parking. We've got parking for about 140 cars on there from Locust Street to Elm. It's uh, almost 400 feet uh, east-west, and it's uh, 125 feet north-south. So lots, lots of parking. The alley's been abated, so you can get you can close that off. And I, but I only own 41 feet of it uh, to the alley but the city owns the rest of it, so it's all usable. So it's, it'll be a, it, and it, we don't, nobody would need that much right now. And it's being looked at by the university, not to tear anything down, but for parking and some other things that's coming. So it is gonna get utilized better. But that's a good building, and it really is a good building. But we decided, again, what does Pittsburgh need? What do we need, and we, you know, we've got, uh, I have quite a few grandchildren, uh, 23. And, uh, and that's a, quite a few. And they all like, anytime time you go, they like to do these different things. And so I said, we need an indoor play area. We need, so we have a climbing wall that's 32 feet, 33 feet, six inches. And it's three climbers at the same time. We have bounce houses and they're nine, some of them, one of them, the big one's 19 feet tall and it slides and ball pits and uh, ski ball and um, what have you. One machine that uh, has 110 games in it and it's, uh, shines on the floor on a mats and things and you step on a uh, can of tube of paint and the paint squirts and you walk through the leaves and it looks like it's 3D and the leaves like they're falling in your face. And uh, so we, we can do four birthday parties at the same time, 50 people each, because it'll hold, that, that room is uh, hold seven, legally, uh, according to code, set code, 770 people. And that don't include the north end of it. And uh, we have four bathrooms in there and we reused all the wood. Uh, I think I had 320 fur true two by sixes that went in 1922 and they were in that heat for all those years and they were really good and dry and straight and they're 16 feet long and we tore that out and everything hung by wire that entire ceilings hung by wire from these beams and so you get up there and you 
cut off the, just a piece at a time and let them drop, and nobody got hurt. And I was up there doing a lot. Of, I did get hit a couple of times, but you know, hard headed, it didn't hurt much. And I had one guy that was special needs that didn't know any better, and uh, I underpaid him because I had to feed him so much. But uh, but he was good help, you know, helping clean up. But we got that building together, and it's a good building. And I've got fencing going into the south end now. We've got furniture and a fire pit and all that stuff for outside. We've never done any advertising. We've never done a grand opening there. But we did l the best weekend we had was 11 birthday parties. And if it wasn't for high school girls, not the boys. The boys ain't worth a flip. They got, <laughs> they got football, kickball, baseball, basketball, jacks. If there's a ball or film, they're never available. The high school girls are really quite good and really, really are good. And we got a couple of young college women, and they're not very good because they got boyfriends and parties and mom and dad's credit card. So they're not reliable. But the high school girls are really terrific, and I'd have to make a hay barn out of it without them, uh, probably, or something. But we did uh, do a thing for the, uh, the Marshallines, the Marshall people. Their islands are sinking. The U.S. government's got six or seven military bases in the Marshall Islands, and we are not giving up any military bases. Y'all that lived here, 3,000 years got to go away, but we're keeping our bases because we want to get to be able to Beijing or we want to be to Russia. We want to be there in 10 or 12 minutes with these big stealth airplanes. And we got submarines, nuclear submarines there, and we have stealth bombers there. And so we're not giving up U.S. military space. That's just a little 10-minute flight from somebody that we don't get along with sometimes. Is it our fault or their fault or both of our faults or whatever? And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but the Marshallines are coming. There have been 100,000 brought to the U.S. in the last two years. Pittsburgh has around six or 700. They're great people. They're really nice. They had a big church function for six days there. And I told him, look, you've got to go home. You all can't stay and sing all night long. And, you, and it's the same music as the Hawaiians and things, and it's, they're really nice people. And, uh, so we, that was the biggest event we had. So we got that done. We own that building. We pay our taxes. We, again, we got zero grant money. Never. It's all private money. Did it all uh, at my wife's great despair. We did it all ourselves. And, uh, uh, but it's okay. It'll be fine. Uh, so I was then, I uh, was working with Randy Vallely to buy Washington School. It was built in 1936. They moved in 1937. And Randy and I signed an agreement on it. In, in the entire block, minus four houses. There are four houses in the northeast corner that uh, Randy didn't own. One of them was empty, and I figured I could buy that, you know, after I get the, the school bought and things. And Randy just used it uh, as a warehouse and hadn't touched it since the day he bought it. It has, does have a basement in the northwest corner. It's not large. It's uh, 40 by about 28, and it's got 17 steps, and it's skinny going down in there, and it had about six foot of water in it. That's where the boilers were at, and they had the asbestos in them and things, and I hired Randy to pump the water out. I said, that's what we'll do. You get the asbestos out. He's certified. I don't know where it goes. It's magic, but it's, uh, it, he takes it away, and he is certified. So I had to deal with Randy. I paid him the down payment, and about 10 days before closing, uh, he called and went over to see him. He said, very important, and he said, uh, i, I got to keep that all the ground on the east side of the alley, which was you know, almost two acres. No, 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 that's the playground. The alley, I got our business city, they're going to bait the alley, going to have that whole piece tied up. Nope, got to have it. I'm not doing that. No, nope. so anyway, he gave me my money back, and we, we departed, and not mad at him. I, I was not mad at him. I tried to act like I wasn't mad at him. That's what I, that's what I mean. But, uh, so we got that done, went on, and then some people come to me and say, what was you going to do with that? And I said, I wasn't sure, but it would make an awful good daycare. And uh, they said, why don't you go back and buy that and buy it all, and we will fund it. And I said, well, who is we? You know, I want to make sure who's, because I had it bought for, for $175,000, which I thought was a decent price for it. It needs a lot of work, a lot of stuff. I said, here's the deal. Here's how I think about it. You've got to leave the building alone. It's a beautiful building. You've got to save the cupola. You've got to save the building. That's fine. No problem. We'll make an extension on it because it needs to be more room because it, it needs to be a daycare. And I said, I agree. Daycare would be perfect there. And so I'm given a budget, which I come in way below. And I go back to Randy. I said, we want to buy this thing. And it's going to be a daycare. And what we want to do, we're going to name, we can't name the street, but we're going to name this alleyway. It's going to get abated. We're going to name it the Randy Valela 
And we're going to put up a plaque on both sides thanking the Valela family because you did save it. It's not tore down. He could have tore it down, sold the lots. He did not do that. So you want to recognize that and, and play to his heartstrings a little bit because he, he, he's still a human. Uh, he, has a, he has a daughter that has now moved back here and his son Johnny died. And I did Johnny's uh, celebration of life at no charge. Johnny had done some work building some ponds for me and met a, a barn for me, building on a little farm out here. And so Johnny and, and Randy knew I liked Johnny and I'd done that. No, I said, no problem, I'm doing it free. And um, Randy was very thankful. He said, I'm gonna sell to you. And so I have a deal with Randy after we got this deal done. I'm going to do Randy's celebration of life. Uh, I said, no charge, you don't have to pay Randy. I said, because there's no one coming but me and you. <laughs> That's why I told him. I said, nobody's going to be there. You know, we, don't, we can do it in the van. You know, it doesn't have to be. And, he, and he's, hi, ah, you, you know. The, <laughs> and that's what I told him. But, so there is a group that now owns the Washington School, and it is a point forward. And it's 100% donated money. 100%. Now, I'm sideways with them over a couple of things because the building looks as bad now as when Randy had it. We closed on it in December of last year paid the back taxes, got the basement pumped out, and got the asbestos out, and that's all done. Randy's got all his stuff out, and there's little over, and they're great people. They're giving their money. But we had a bit of a falling out. Not, not serious, that's serious, hell, they're all serious. But you gotta get moving. You cannot piddle around. We should have had a big billboard up saying, coming whenever. But the Kansas Fire Marshal's been there, the state's been there, and the daycare's been there. It is going to be a daycare. We have, uh, we have. They have uh, a little over $3 million after this is now, currently. And they've got some really good people that are given a lot of money, families that are given money. And it's the same big ones. But the great thing about this is not going to have John Doe and Jane Doe's name on it. It's going to be whatever the name of the daycare is at the old Washington School. And I think that's great. The problem I have and the sideways I got with them a little bit, there needs to be a couple really big signs, both sides of the building saying, Old Washington School, let people donate their $10, $25, or $50. My grandkids went there, my daughter went there, or I taught there, or whatever. Let the public have a buy-in because it's going to be a daycare for 151. It's approved for 151 children. It needs to be seven days a week, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., at least six days a week at that because people have to work different shifts. A lot of people now work four 12-hour shifts, and they, you need to provide that. It's hard to find somebody, and there was a, I was with the group uh, that was going to run the daycare. During COVID, there was $750,000 grant for daycare for Crawford County. The money cannot be used to buy a building or to buy land, period. Can't be used for that. And you have to have a minimum number of clients. I don't remember what the number was large number. There was only one place in Crawford County that qualified and it's the Washington School. So they got the $750,000 grant. Which is, you know, so that's, that's the, it's a little over $3 million and you think that's enough to do it. It's not enough to do everything. It's going to take about, the entire project's about close to $7 million because there's a big addition on and kitchens and all the things, all the things you have to do for daycare. So that gets done. But the problem with when you do that, government moves at glacial speed. No, no hurry on anything. Now you have to bid everything back out. You got this grant money. Now you have to make sure that you allow, you know, you bid it so minorities and women owned. And all of that's fair and square. And they need to have that right to do it. And if they're, you know, if it's women owned and, a, and they're a minority owned and women owned, and if they're missing a leg, they're handicapped. I get all these other points on them, see. So you find one and cripple them so they can make them easier to buy. But... It can be 10% higher and they'll still get the, the bid. And that's fair. That's okay. But you have to bid them out again. So that adds 90 days to it. So during this time period, nothing happens. More windows get broke out. Kids get in and cats are in there and they're the marmots. So it's, um, it's things that happen. It delays it. We should have had the roof on. You've got to get a roof on these buildings. If you're going to save a building, get the envelope. Get, get it closed up. Get it saved. Get it dry. Not so much for security, but get them done. There is grant money out there, as I said, and uh, it's, it's not hard to, to qualify for it. You've got to have a good idea and a good business plan of what you're going to do. 
but you've got to be able to buy the place and do all the work and pay all the bills and pay the taxes and have a good, clean, clear title to everything, or else you're not going to get a penny. And that's how it works, and that's why it's difficult for people. Um, I would like to do one more. My wife uh, is, tells me that's why she's not here. Really. Uh, and she, and don't, those of you that know her don't say anything uh, uh, yet. Uh, but I don't know if I will or not. I got some stuff. But those are the three buildings that I've been involved in. Pittsburgh is really, really blessed. Franklin's blessed. Look at this facility right here. Uh, I attended a um, Kansas uh, workshop Friday. There's only three people, four people there besides me. One of them's Big Brutus. Big Brutus will not qualify for grant money. It's not a building. You've got to be a building to qualify. The land itself won't qualify. So they don't qualify. There is some tax credits they can get to. Now you can take a tax credit. If it's a $100,000 tax credit, you can go to Commerce Bank and they'll give you 90 cents on a dollar. So you could get 90,000 out of that. Our vest pays 91 cents on a dollar, so you get a little more money out of them. But, uh, so it is, a, I mean, it is a valuable, you can go sell it or you can use it if you've got lots of taxes, you can spare it out and pay your taxes with it. So those things are available and they're out there. It's difficult. If it was easy, you know, people would be, you'd see more. The other thing that tears buildings down is fire suppression. Fire suppression in the Frisco, and I put in a dry system. You can get a dry system or a wet system. Commercial building has to have steel fire suppression. And the bigger the building, the bigger the pipe you have to have. So in the Frisco, I was able to use five-inch pipe. There's a 12-inch line. You've got to come off of the 12-inch line. It's out in the edge of 126 Highway, 4th Street. So now I have to deal with the state. And the state says, okay, you've got to close two blocks each direction. I said, Wait a minute, that puts me a block the other side of Broadway and a block the other side of Joplin. I can't close. You're not going to let me close. Well, that's the, what you've got to do. So I talked to Riddell, who does most of that work. I said, what are we going to do? And he said, Saturday morning, just put up your barricades both ends of the block, and we'll have it dug and tapped and filled in before they come back to work Monday. So that's what we did. <clears throat> There's, it's called a workaround. It's not illegal. It's not legal, but it's not illegal. It's, uh, it's a workaround. And uh, so that was able. And so we got that in. But I wanted a dry system because it, if you're not using it, you don't want to heat it, and you don't want it to freeze up and bust. And so I put in a dry system, which has got a battery back. It's got a generator and battery backup, and it's got an air compressor, and it keeps air in them. And it will flood from the, from the main valve to the furthest point in about two seconds you know, through a four-inch pipe. So, but that's about $100,000, and, and that's not a big system. And so I have to do one at the fun zone, the old pit crab building, and it's 15,000, almost 16,000 square feet. And I've got over 1,400 foot of pipe in there. Now there's an eight inch line runs up and down Locust Street. That's not big enough. I have to have a 12 inch line. So I have to go two blocks south and I have to go underground. I can't go through people's yards. It's got to go underground. And Riddell's bill was sizable. And that's a wet system. And it's, uh, the valve's going to cost you the same. It looks like it came from Mars. It's a big fancy thing, valves and buttons and stuff all over. They're about $12,000. There's three people that make them, three companies, probably the same company, three different names. And they're all within a couple hundred bucks of each other. And two of the three is in New Jersey, one in New York. So you know they're all together. But it's pricey. And so that one's about $185,000. And that's what's tearing down buildings. You cannot, if you've got to go in and do business, and you can't fault somebody for this, if you've got to go in there and make a living and do business and be profitable, you cannot spend the amount of money it takes to rehab a building and put in $200,000 with fire suppression. Somehow, you'd have to have a Roman candle to catch anything on fire in the, in the fun zone, in the old pit. It's 48 feet before you get to any wood. It's brick and concrete until you get up there. Sorry, the code says, I like John Wayne's code, go to hell. You know. <laughs> but you can't say that you know, out loud. But... So you have to live with the code, you've got to make it work. But there needs to be a way, tax incentives or something, because we all want to save buildings. Some of them, uh, I've got a friend in Wichita that had two beautiful buildings, two hotels, four stories on Kellogg Street. Great location, beautiful. They were on the National Register, and if you're privately owned, you can tear them down. I can tear down either building. National Register doesn't stop private individuals. 
Now, if you turn it into a museum or a city daycare or a city library or a city hall or a state or federal, whatever, now you're, now you're different rules. Privately owned, I can tear them down. And if I sell them to somebody, they could tear them down. Well, I wouldn't sell to somebody without a contract saying, you know, of course, you'd find another lawyer to change that somewhere down the street. But, but those are the things that make it difficult. It takes too much money to rehab one to do sometimes to comply. Uh, they're worth doing. The Frisco is really quite busy. The, f the fun spot, as the city calls it, it's actually Fun Depot. Uh, is quite busy. The kids love it. Pittsburgh needs it. We've never done a grand opening. We're going to someday. But, and I would like to maybe do one more and we'll see how that goes. I got an eye on when I talk to them and we'll see. Uh, and it needs not as much. It's got a good roof and that's a big, big, <laughs> big piece. But, but that's, that's the three buildings and uh, I, own, uh, I own two that are on the National Register. And, and the Mackey building can be on the National Register. And, and, and so if you find one, and you do something with it, and you need to get started, you can, st you can add that value. <clears throat> Both of these buildings, the, the Frisco and the Mackey building and the, and the funds on all have at least $150,000 worth of tax credits and or money that can be spent on them. It takes it, you know, you have to apply first. And so what I would do is, I'm not gonna do it, uh, I would add some value if I sold them because that value is there. If you wanna do a new, new air conditioning, new something or whatever, uh, the money's there. You could go ahead, you have to apply first. So there, there are ways, it's another workaround, another way to come back for a bite of the apple of sorts. But you have to know the rules. They're very difficult to comply with and, and to follow and to do. But they're worth doing. And I want to talk one more thing about, no more buildings. I want to talk one about coal, okay? I'm going to make this real quick. Carthy just finished their Marion days. And they had, what, 35, 40,000 people. And say, why in the world didn't Pittsburgh or Franklin or Irma get Marion Day? What in the world's going on? How come they get 30,000 people come in there from all over the country? Pittsburgh, Kansas had Marion Days from 1930 to 1935. Nobody ever heard of it. Marion Days. That's what it is. Marion Days, Pittsburgh, Kansas, October 27, 1932. I've got the brochure. They ran five trains in here. Ran one out of New York City. All highfalutin financiers coming in here to uh, celebrate the coal fields. And that's what it was from about 1930 for five years. They'd get 40, 50,000 people here doing uh, coal business. And Marion is the Marion Steam Shovel Company, and it was Marion days. But they would bring 20,000 people here, and I've, I'm yet to find anybody that's ever heard of it. People have been here for years and years and years and they've never heard of it. Sometimes it's good to have some of this stuff. And one of the things that's interesting, well, a lot of things are interesting, but coal shovels. This is about, you know, Mary and, and the early shovels and you, Linda spoke about one they're getting in here and you're going to get a great big one uh, soon that's uh, officially announced. But here's a great piece of history that nobody seems to realize. The earliest, quote, the earliest application of a power steam shovel to coal stripping was an Otis shovel installed in 1877. Installed in 1877 near Pittsburgh, Kansas. 1877. Way, way, way early. And that's, uh, that's from the Marion Steam Shovel Company and they're still in business. Uh, this is a 1932 model. Uh, this is a 32 mop, so uh, they're going to get scanned and be available for things. I've been hiding them. But, uh, when Mackie Clement left, they took all the junk and they left me the good stuff. I've got maps and, and most of you can identify. I've got all kinds of deeds. I bet I've got five or 6,000 deeds, land transfers and things. And more than half of them are signed with an X. Somebody else had to witness them. They didn't know what, and they were 25 cents an acre for the mineral rights, and they'd dig them up and go off and leave them and things. But... The railroads and the mining company needed each other and worked together. And they ran unit coal trains out of here from, from right there behind the Frisco to, to uh, they ran to Corpus Christi, Texas, and they ran them to uh, Pensacola, Florida, 50 cars at a time, 40-ton 40, 40 cars. Now these coal trains you see are 120-ton cars. But these were 40-ton, and they were running coal trains out of here. So that's, uh, 
I, I like to talk about the railroads as well as the, because they had to have each other. The railroads burned, consumed between 22 and 28 percent of the coal that was dug out of here. That was their fuel. They, on all the railroads, had their own mines. They went by a different subsidiary name, but they all had their own mines. And so that's, uh, it's a great thing. It's a great history. It's a, I hope there's more of these buildings that don't get destroyed, but I also understand why it happens. You simply, business-wise, you can't justify it, and it's uh, pretty hard to do. But I thank you for listening. I'd answer any question if somebody had one or two. It, it, it's at 4th and Locust, right on the corner of that tan building, right across the catty corner from the best hotel. Uplink. Oh. Uplink. It's now Uplink. Yeah, okay. Uplink is a local company. Doing very well. It's a good company. Yeah, they talk about Stillwell Hotel. They're, Arthur Stillwell was president and chairman of the board of Kansas City Southern, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, and Gulf. That's where he came from. And so he, he, uh, he started in the barbed wire business. He held a, uh, uh, and it, part of it, a machine, the invented machine that made barbed wire without having to do a lot of stuff by hand. He made lots of money. Then he got this insurance money and cheated some people out of some more money on the insurance side or whatever it happened. And he ended up in the railroad business, a baron now. And, and uh, he, he built the Kansas City Southern to Port Arthur. So Ar Port Arthur is named after him. Hotel Stillwells uh, carries his name. But originally, they, would, they, they were were going to go straight south. Yes. Yeah, they're going and to Mendon. They, they didn't want to come in Kansas and have a separate company. So in Kansas, they were the Kansas City, Pittsburgh, and Gulf. You had to pay more taxes. You had to have headquarters. You had to have a building. So there's reasons not to do it, financial reasons not to do it. But he decided it was worth doing. Pittsburgh was growing, and, it was, and it's turned out to be a great thing. And now the Kansas City Southern doesn't exist. It's now the Canadian Pacific, Kansas City. So, and that's not a bad thing. It's the only transcontinental railroad in the United States that goes coast to coast. The only one. So, Does it now go to Mexico also? Kansas City Southern goes from Mexico all the way from uh, Laredo and, uh, and Brownsville all the way to the, well, within a few miles of the Guatemalan border. The Mexican government owns the last 20 miles, but they have trackage rights. And I've been down there a hundred times, more that than that. something that Arthur still will. Yeah. Too. yeah, when he lost the Kansas City Southern, he went on, when you see the grand tour we read about when they got on the ship, sailing ships and made the tour around the world, uh, he made a grand tour, him and his wife, and when he came back, he didn't have a job. The board voted him out and bought him out and different things, so he started a different railroad and didn't, wasn't very successful the second time around, but, uh, uh, but he was uh, quite, a, quite an individual. So I thank you for listening, and uh, hey, if you're bored, I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> I think I'm off. Yeah. Yeah. Take you off. All right. Take you off. Thank you. Get that. Well, let's give him another round of applause. We could probably listen to him for another hour. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. You need to have more janitors. We appreciate you, Larry. We appreciate you saving some of our buildings and some of our culture. Um, I have a couple of announcements before, you know, we have the house is open. So if you'd like to go out, Jerry will be, uh, Lonchak will be there to do some tours. And we'll also have some uh, beverages for you. But there are a couple of programs coming up. One just kind of came in sort of all of a sudden. It'll be next Sunday. Uh, it involves um, a book called um, Sinkhole. And uh, there's a wonderful and kind of tragic story behind it, but the author is Juliet Patterson, and she's going to be here uh, through, and let me just give credit to the people who are involved, who are getting her here, the Pitt State Writers Fest, and also the Pitt State University's Women's Studies Lecture Series, Distinguished Writing uh, writer series and the Student Fee Council, and she'll be here on Sunday at two talking about this book. Uh, you know, the uh, let me just give you a, a little paragraph description because it does have to do with tragedy in her family, but the background has to do with uh, Southeast Kansas uh, roots. 
Patterson's book, which deals with the legacy and inheritance of suicide in one American family, is also a deep look into her roots here. She visited and researched Southeast Kansas, giving special interest to its abandoned mines and extensive undermining days, as well as the sinkholes, to gather historical evidence and imagine the final days of her maternal and paternal grandfathers, one a fiery pro-labor politician and the other a melancholy businessman. Both died by their own hand, as did her father in Minneapolis. So uh, she has roots here, she has uh, family here, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful book. It, it, it's won um, the 2003 Minnesota Book Award and the very prestigious 2022 Library Journal has, has, uh, uh, has named it as one of the best memoirs. So she'll be here to uh, talk a, a little bit, read from the book, and she'll have some books to sell, and we hope that you join us for that. Uh, coming up, Part. She'll also be at the public library on Monday night. Oh, okay. okay. So we have we have Sunday, and then and then Carol Ann Ross and says, at what time? A uh, it'll be a different program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's kind of you know hinting at different parts of uh, of her book, uh, and 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 different people who are are having her. And I think the college is then having her on on Tuesday. Um, our next quarterly exhibit is right around the corner, and that's uh, starts October the second. Phyllis Bittner will be the uh, host. And the title is Croatian Heritage in Southeast Kansas. So we'll have an exhibit set up and there's gonna be some exciting things about around that, music and some of uh, uh, surprises. There'll be some surprises uh, coming along with that, but please join us for that. And the first program with that uh, quarterly will be October 22nd. And if you all have uh, you know, your newsletters, it, it'll be coming out soon and they'll tell you uh, uh, all about this uh, in, in your membership newsletter. Uh, also, just a, a little plug for Making Spirits Bright. I don't know if any of you went to our last one, our fundraiser last year, which was sold out, by the way. And it'll be November the 18th, and ticket sales are going to be coming out soon. If you're a member, uh, September the 18th, uh, you'll be uh, notified of how you can get your tickets for that event. And for everyone else in the general public, they'll come out in October 18th. Um, you know, have, have you guys noticed we have pretty good sound here? You know, did you, did you notice that? Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you. Like, but, but one thing we don't have, uh, you know, we, we have a TV, but we, we don't have like a projector series, you know, right here right now with the screen. And fortunately, Broadway Electronics is going to donate us a seven-foot screen. David will be happy because, you know, <laughs> he has to move his camera around. Um, but we're going to have to raise funds for a projector. So we're going to, Phyllis is going to put that probably out on, the, on uh, Facebook. And if you want to donate to that cause, that's, that's something that we, uh, you know, we're going to be happy to have. Uh, is there anything else that we need to talk about before you have some pizza? There's some pizza there, different things, little French cookies. Please go out to the, out to the house if you hadn't seen it. And uh, thank you so much, all of you, for coming. It was really nice to see all of you. Thank you. <laughs>